My name is Lukas Aumeyer. Today I'm going to talk about breaking and fixing virtual channels, the domino attack and domino. So this is a joint work together with Pedro, uh, Aniket and Matteo. Um, so let me quickly outline what's in store for this talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about existing virtual channel constructions and the new attack that we find uh, on them. Then I'm going to present Donna, which is a new virtual channel construction that is secure against this attack, but also has some other nice features. For instance, it provides a generic solution for hosting apps or multiple hops in payment channel networks. It provides fair, unlimited lifetime and fee model. It only has a constant overhead and it provides better security, privacy, and latency. So with this, let's jump into some background. So as you also heard this mo morning in the first blockchain session, uh, permissionless cryptocurrencies have a scalability issue. So we have a global data structure, a blockchain usually, that records every transaction globally, and we have a consensus mechanism on top of this where every user verifies every transaction in this blockchain. And this leads to a bottleneck. So in Bitcoin, for instance, we can uh, handle only tens of transactions per second, which is not a lot if we compare it to more centralized uh, payment systems. For instance, Visa can handle tens of thousands of transactions a second. So what can we do? There are many uh, ideas. One of them uh, is off-chain solutions. The main idea is, okay, let's not uh, commit every transaction on the blockchain, but if we're two parties that want to do some payments, uh, we do some payments off-chain, we keep them locally, and we use the blockchain as a fallback mechanism in case there is a dispute. So among these uh, solutions, uh, we have payment channels as a, a very prominent one. And is a two-party protocol that works like this. We have Alice and Bob that want to do some transactions between one another. What they can do is they can put a transaction on-chain, opening the payment channel, and uh, in this transaction, the funding transaction, they lock some coins. Then they just exchange some payments off-chain where they redistribute these coins back and forth as often as they want, right? And finally, when they are done, they can put the latest of these transactions on the chain again and effectively close the uh, payment channel. So in the end, only two transactions went on-chain even though the two parties uh, conducted multi multiple transactions between one another. So this is already a nice solution for two parties, but it doesn't scale uh, out of the box, right? So because we need to lock up some money, it is infeasible to open a, a payment channel to everyone else, right? So to create sort of a click. So what happens instead is we have a network that is more sparse and where the existing payment channels are connected to form a network, and within this network, any two parties that are connected via a path of payment channels, they can do a payment to one another. And this sort of payment is also no, uh, known as uh, multi-hop payment. And there exists a very prominent uh, implementation of this, the Lightning Network that has quite some money in it and also some quite some nodes and channels. Uh, but it also has gained some attention from like industry, for instance, Visa Research or this central bank digital currencies. So uh, these multi-hop payments, they're already quite a nice solution for the scalability problem, but they also have some limitations. So one of the limitations is they only work for payments. Another limitation is that each payment is routed via intermediaries. This leads to some additional things. So Every time an intermediary routes a payment, the intermediary charges some fees. The intermediary learns about the value of the uh, payment, leading to less privacy. And the, in the intermediary can go offline or crash or whatever, which makes the payment less reliable. So what we would like instead is we would like a solution that works on like discrete lock, uh, lock contracts or these conditional payments that we heard in the first talk of this session, games, betting, or basically any other application. We would also like a solution that involves the intermediaries only for like a setup and a closure phase, but not for every transaction itself. And this would in turn lead to less fees, uh, more privacy, and more reliability. So and this brings us neatly to virtual channels. So what are virtual channels? The main idea is essentially we want to bypass intermediaries and create a direct connection between two users. 
But the difference to a payment channel is that now we don't fund the channel on the chain. So we fund the channel off chain on the on top of the existing payment channel infrastructure, as you can see on this picture. So and there exists some uh, work on this subject, which I'm go briefly going to outline. So it all started in 2017, where Jambowski et al. introduced Perun, which is the first virtual channel uh, construction that works over one intermediary and relies on Turing complete scripting. So it is compatible with Ethereum-like languages, uh, currencies. So this was later generalized by the same authors, or by, by Jambowski et al., uh, to include multiple intermediaries and multiple parties of the virtual channels. Um, but all of them still relied on Turing complete scripting. So uh, in 2020, uh, we introduced the first Bitcoin compatible virtual channel construction with also the limitation that it only works over one intermediary. Concurrently to this work, uh, Yarenko et al. introduced a construction that works over multiple intermediaries but is built on top of uh, payment channels with a limited lifetime. So it's not compatible with the Lightning Network, for instance. And more recently still, uh, Kaya et al. introduced Elmo, a virtual channel construction that also works over multiple intermediaries and has some uh, efficiency improvements, but it relies on an opcode that is not supported in the current Bitcoin. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the Bitcoin-compatible virtual channel constructions. And now I'm going to outline a design paradigm that all of them share. And this design is what we call a rooted design. So it basically what it entails is um, assume that um, we have Alice who wants to open a virtual channel to Eve. So the way she does it, and I'm going to present this on a high level for the lightweight virtual channel construction, but it's essentially similar for all of the Bitcoin compatible constructions. So the way it works is first, Alice uh, builds a virtual channel with uh, Carol on top of the two underlying payment channels, like shown on the picture. Then using this virtual channel and the payment channel between Carol and Dave, she constructs a virtual channel that is one hop longer. And finally, she uses the payment channel between Dave and Eve and this virtual channel to construct the full virtual channel over the whole length. And this is the way uh, the, the virtual channel is constructed. So I want to outline two things that we can notice here. Uh, first, this design means that the virtual channel is funded from each of the underlying payment channels. In other words, the inputs for this virtual channel comes directly or indirectly from all of the underlying payment channels. Second, the endpoints don't have now control over all of these inputs that are necessary uh, to put the virtual channel on chain if necessary, which means that we need to have some mechanism in place that somehow allows the endpoints to enforce this balance or to put this this virtual channel on chain in case of a dispute. Right. And these two observations essentially lead to the new attack that we name domino attack. And this attack works like this. So assume we have Alice and Eve who are controlled by an adversary. And now, because they need to have this sort of mechanism that allows them to put the virtual channel on chain, what they can do is that Eve can initiate this sequence, this kind of sequence where they put the virtual channel on chain, and kind of now Dave needs to react. So Dave is forced, beca because of the way the virtual channel is built, to kind of close this underlying virtual channel because otherwise he would lose some money. This is kind of this mechanism I was talking about. Okay, so now Dave also initiates the sequence to put this virtual channel AD on chain. Okay, now this puts Carol in a spot where Carol needs to react or otherwise she will lose money. So she initiates the sequence to put this virtual channel on chain. And finally, uh, Alice, uh, sorry, Bob needs to put the, the payment channel between him and Alice on chain. And then when all of these channels are on chain, these this disputes can be settled and all of the virtual channels can be put on chain 
And finally, this, this whole sequence is complete. But we notice now that all of the underlying payment channels are now closed and on chain. So the takeaway here is that an attacker can not only interfere with the virtual channels itself, but it, an attacker can really use this attack to shut down the underlying payment channel network itself. So we did actually a simulation on the Lightning Network, and we have shown that it takes only around one Bitcoin for an attacker to shut down the whole Lightning Network. So we, we really want to emphasize that these existing constructions should not be used in practice. Okay, so this brings us to the, to the new virtual channel construction, which we name Donna. And essentially, let's recall the reasons for the domino attack, and then we see how we get rid of this attack. So the two main reasons were, A, it's funded from the underlying channels, and B, the endpoints need a way to enforce the balance. So what we do is we try to get rid of funding the virtual channel from the underlying channels, and also we replace this second point with saying, okay, the endpoints now are instead guaranteed that they won't lose any money. So how can we do this? The main idea is as follows. Alice, who wa let's say, wants to create the virtual channel with Dave. So what she does is she says, okay, hey, Dave, let me fund the virtual channel from a transaction that is called funding transaction. But this transaction does not exist, right? So the transaction looks something like this. However, there, it's not on chain or, or something like this, right? So it just, it's just created off chain by Alice. Okay, so now Alice says, okay, let's pretend that this transaction exists anyway, and we keep using it for, the, for our virtual channel. So now for, in order to, to, to ensure that Dave doesn't lose any money, right, because he does not have any control over the funding of the virtual channel, Alice sets up a collateral payment to Dave, such that if the funding transaction goes on chain, then Alice will get the money back from this payment. Right? So this is the kind of the logic we want to encode. However, if the funding transaction does not go on chain, then the payment go goes through to Dave. So either, either way, Dave will be, will be safe. Why? The rationale is that posting this funding transaction essentially is the same as transforming the payment channel to a virtual, uh, sorry, the virtual channel to a payment channel, right? So then it would be the same as a payment channel and the Dave can simply claim the money. If Alice does not do this, right, then Dave is compensated from the payment. So, so we can see that in both ways, Dave is safe. So now the ch challenge remains, how can we make it such that these two events are kind of mutually exclusive? Okay, and the way we do it is like this. So I'm going to proceed to present this in steps. So first, uh, Alice sets the payment such that it is su successful not immediately but only after some time, let's say after one week. Okay, before one week, Alice can actually refund the payment. And now the crucial step is she can refund the payment only if the funding transaction is posted. And this is really the most crucial step. How can we ensure that the refund can only be posted if the funding transaction is posted? We can put some very, very small outputs in the funding transaction, like this would ideally be zero, but you can think of it as a, a very small, economically insignificant value. And this is used as an input for each of the refunds in the channel. So, it, so from the UTXO model, this really means that the refunds can only happen if this funding transaction goes on chain. And this is a trick that is borrowed from a Ustix paper called Blitz. And you can see that if Alice doesn't publish it, then the payment goes through. If she publishes it, then she can refund. Okay, so this is kind of the construction, how they set it up. So they can now kind of keep using the channel by performing some updates, you know, setting some, sending some payments back and forth. And finally, when they are done, they can close the virtual channel. And this is kind of the second crucial step. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into how it works exactly, but the main idea is to make it work uh, kind of to, to ensure that we can close without going on chain, we can see that what we need to do is we need to update the payment on the bottom 
from 10 bitcoins, which is the full virtual channel capacity, to 4 bitcoin, which is the final balance of Dave in the virtual channel. Such that um, if Alice simply waits until this timeout, then Dave will get his rightful balance after this time t, after one week we said. So the, the main challenges, and this is we show in the paper with a new operation, is how to atomically update this payment from one value to another pe pe uh, value. So I encourage you to check out the paper for more info. Also on more, for more info on how we extend the lifetime to potentially indefinitely. How we implement the fair fee model that allows intermediaries to charge exactly for the amount of money and the time they, put, they have to lock up the money. How we uh, do the performance evaluation and see that we only have, we can reduce the on-chain overhead in the worst case, in the dispute, from linear to a single transaction and the off-chain storage from linear to constant per party. And finally, we formalize the, mod, the, the protocol in the UC framework and analyze its security and privacy. So to sum up, we introduce a new devastating attack on existing virtual channel schemes and a new secure virtual channel schemes that has all these other nice features. So with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions or feel free to reach out to me via uh, social media. Thanks. If not, let me ask one first. Um, do you have a read on what are the practical use cases that you think that you can use Blitz for? Sorry. Well, can you elaborate on any practice you like that Blitz gets implemented over the Lightning Network or one of these uh, networks? So you, like, you make all or I don't have yeah. it. So the paper that you present is uh, how can we use the practice? So what would be the practical use cases that you think? So the main practical use case that I see is that now we only know how to do payments over the, the, the payment generator. With this construction, we could really host any application, like DLCs, for instance, is a very interesting application that is currently uh, being discussed in the Lightning community. But this only works for uh, two users that share a direct payment channel. So we don't know how we can uh, route discrete flow contracts, DLCs, between any two users in the network. But with this, we kind of have a generic solution how we can connect any two users and allow them essentially to have a discrete flow contract, for instance, or any other application that we can think of essentially. Thanks.